midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward path had been lost. And during my journey, as I made my way through the tangled labyrinthine paths of deception, looking for the center of truth, I met a brilliant woman who taught me many a flat fact. But out of all of her flat facts, it was one fact that struck a chord. She showed me the maps of old and asked me to find the key anomaly, the one error that all maps contained. I pointed to the varying representations of unknown land masses, to Hyperborea. She shook her head, no, find the glitch. We live on a flat plane. Our world is an electromagnetic terrarium surrounded by an ethereal sea of water. And like all terrariums, after initial creation, they begin to form their own self-sustaining atmosphere. The sun and the moon journey above our flat realm in concentric spirals. There are five prominent circles of latitude, we are told. We have the Arctic Circle, closest to the center. The Tropic of Cancer, at 23.5 degrees latitude, in the Northern Hemisphere. The Equator, at 0 degree latitude. The Tropic of Capricorn, at 23.5 degrees latitude, in the Southern Hemisphere and the Antarctic Circle. The sun journeys from the equator at the March equinox up in concentric spirals to the Tropic of Cancer. When the sun is in this position, the Northern Hemisphere experience summer and the Southern Hemisphere experience winter. After which, the sun turns and begins making its way back to the equator. The word tropic stems from the Latin word tropicus, which means pertaining to a turn. The sun journeys back, taking the same concentric spiral path, and reaches the equator again. It then keeps going and reaches the Tropic of Capricorn. When the sun is in this position, the southern hemisphere experience summer, and the northern hemisphere experience winter. After a time, the sun turns and begins making its way back to the equator for the March equinox. The equinox occurs when the sun is journeying the circle of the equator, and those living along this line of latitude will see the sun directly overhead at a 90 degree angle at solar noon. The March equinox marks the season of spring in the northern hemisphere and the September equinox marks a season of autumn. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, this is reversed, and the September equinox marks spring, and the March equinox autumn. It is important to note that the Sun never reaches the Arctic Circle, nor does it reach the Antarctic Circle. It never reaches the poles. It journeys to the tropic circles, and then turns back. The point at which the sun reaches its most northerly and southerly excursion relative to the equator is called the solstice. Solstice comes from the Latin word solstitium, which means point at which the sun seems to stand still. And indeed, many do note that the sun seems to stop on the solstices. And this is because, in a sense, it does. It reaches the most northerly and southerly excursion and turns back. But why the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn? Who names these circles of latitude? Our historical ancestors did. They had clocks that not only told them the seconds of the hour, the hours in the day, but also the moment of dusk and dawn and the current phase of the moon. Their clocks understood the true time, the bigger picture. They understood the celestial clock. The stars above us, beyond our firmament, 
and in the waters above revolve at a constant one degree every four minutes from east to west, that is, anti-clockwise. This means they revolve at 15 degrees each hour. 15 degrees multiplied by 24 hours is 360, a full circle. The stars above are fixed. They do not stray from their anti-clockwise journey, but revolve and complete a full circle every day. Our ancient, historical ancestors knew this. They assigned the stars above into fixed constellations. They divided the 360 degree circle of the sky above into 12 divisional arcs of 30 degrees, in which each constellation of the zodiac resides in. They designated each constellation in each 30 degree arc with an anthropomorphic symbol, most of which are animals. Zodiac is an interesting word. Zodiac, the arcs of the zoo. Yes, the parallels with Noah's Ark are strikingly obvious. Each constellation of the Zodiac moves from its fixed position in the waters above at one degree every 72 years. The stars in the circle above us are fixed in their positions, but every 72 years, the entire circle shifts one degree. This is what is called the precession of the equinox. Remember, each arc is 30 degrees. If we multiply 72 with 30, we get 2160 years. It takes 2,160 years for the circle above to shift one whole arc. Astronomers call this an age, and this is what is meant by entering or the dawn of a new age. As Wikipedia tells us, the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn were named such because many years ago, in the days before Christ, the days before BC, the sun was in the constellation of Cancer at the June solstice, and the sun was in the constellation of Capricorn at the December solstice. What does it mean for the sun to be in a given constellation during the solstice? It means the position of the sun in the sky at solar noon. Of course, during solar noon, we would not actually be able to see the stars in the firmament beyond. Therefore, to discern the sun's position relative to the constellations requires either one, a thorough understanding of the stars and their positions above. Our ancient ancestors, we are told, created star charts and used devices such as astrolabes. Or two, computer technology that is able to map and overlap the sun's position against the backdrop of the stars and constellations at solar noon. The sun's presence in the constellation of a given zodiac sign means exactly as it sounds. At solar noon, on the day of the solstice, the sun should be in front of a given constellation. Look closer at the zodiac wheel featured on the dial of these clocks. Here we see that both the constellations of Cancer and Capricorn are polar opposites to one another. These are the names of the two lines of latitude on the maps and that we use to discern the sun's most northerly and southerly excursion above our flat plain. All historical cartographic world maps display both these circles of latitude as Cancer and Capricorn. We see it here on Mercator's maps. On the Ortelius. On the Rouge. On the Urbano Monte. Cartographic maps combine so called science with aesthetics to communicate spatial information effectively. They strive to be accurate. 
and we still use this designation of Cancer and Capricorn for these circles of latitude on our cartographic maps today. Google Earth also uses these designations. But why? As Wikipedia states, when this line of latitude was named in the last centuries BC, the sun was in the constellation Cancer at the June solstice, the time each year that the sun reaches its zenith at this latitude. Similarly, when the Tropic of Capricorn was named, the sun was in the constellation of Capricorn at the December solstice. And the wheel of the zodiac makes this very easy to understand. For instance, if the sun is in any given constellation at solar noon on the June solstice, then its counterpart on the December solstice will always be in the constellation opposite to the June sign. And this is represented with a straight vertical line. If, for instance, the sun was in the constellation of Aries at the June solstice, then it will appear in the constellation of Libra in the December solstice. If the sun was in the constellation of Pisces at the June solstice, then it will be in the constellation of Virgo during the December solstice. These signs are, in a sense, bound in their opposition to one another. And this is where it becomes interesting. The vertical line here represents the tropic circles and their respective constellations during the solstices. But they are governed by another circle of latitude, the equator. On the wheel, this is represented by the horizontal line. And you'll see that the lines form a cross. The equator and the tropic circles are bound in unison by this cross. Remember, the zodiac is the clock face of the circle of stars above us. When one turns anti-clockwise, the rest follow. And just like the signs of the solstices, the left hand of the horizontal line here represents the constellation the sun is in during the March equinox, and the right hand side representative of the sign during the September equinox. And it is the left hand side of the cross, the March equinox, or what is referred to as the vernal equinox, and its zodiac sign, which acts as a reference point for the entire celestial coordinate system. It's called the first point of Aries. The naming of this reference point after the sign Aries is arbitrary, or so they say. We also use it as a reference point for naming the age we are in. And if we start in the age of Aries, we can illustrate the precession of the equinox and the designation of constellations to their corresponding circles of latitude quite clearly. For instance, if the sun is in the constellation of Aries during the March equinox, then we have the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. We also see that the sun will be in the constellation of Libra during the September equinox. Now the stars above us are revolving anti-clockwise from their usual fixed positions at one degree every 72 years, and a whole zodiac arc every 2160 years. So let's jump 2160 years to the age of Pisces. The sun is, of course, in Pisces during the March equinox. We have the Tropic of Gemini and Sagittarius and the sun in Virgo during the September equinox. You'll no doubt have noticed that the wheel represented here turns clockwise and that's because it's a representation of the constellations as if your view was outside of the firmament and looking down on the stars. If you were standing underneath this wheel and looking up, it would rotate anti-clockwise. I am using the clockwise representation because it is the best way to illustrate the precession of the equinox. This rotation keeps shifting one arc every 2160 years until the wheel makes a full circle of what is known as a great year. Why is this important? What we see here 
and what the mainstream narrative confirms is that the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn occurred during the age of Aries. For the last 2000 years or so, we have been in the age of Pisces. Remember, an age lasts for roughly 2160 years. And we are now on the cusp of entering into the age of Aquarius. On June 2020, during the solstice, the sun entered the border of Taurus and therefore the transition has already begun. And Google will tell you this yourself if you search. A new age or a procession of 30 degrees into a new constellation on the March equinox is not some new age, pseudo-spiritual fantasy of astrologists and yogis alike. It is an astronomical law of the stars above in the firmament and you can track it yourself every equinox and solstice. It is a critical and integral component in the function of our realm. If we are entering the age of Aquarius, then that means that the Sun has not been in the constellation of Cancer or Capricorn during the solstice for over 2000 years when our realm was in the age of Aries. All the old and current cartographic maps and even Google Earth represent these circles of latitude as a tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. There are no maps that present the tropic lines correctly as they should be in the age of Pisces, our current age. Wikipedia and other mainstream narratives of deception tell us that our ancient historical ancestors of horse and car and copper chisels named these circles of latitude in the times of BC and no one in the course of history that followed bothered to change the names of the tropics to their accurate designation. We are in the age of Pisces and have been for over 2000 years. The circles of latitude should be called the Tropic of Gemini and the Tropic of Sagittarius. And so what? What's in a name? But this brilliant lady who taught me this flat fact was patient. What's in a name? Everything. And until she said it, I didn't realize how stupid I'd been to overlook this. Maps are not just pretty projections of the landmass on Earth. They are practical instruments of navigation. Our ancient historical ancestors, we are told, depended on celestial navigation, on the position of the stars in the firmament above to guide their way when at sea, follow the North Star. And if perchance their compasses failed, then knowing the map of the stars above would be critical. Believing that our ancestors just continued to use the designation of Cancer and Capricorn for the tropics that was established by their own historical ancestors who belong to a different age entirely is absurd. Celestial navigation would have been an essential skill set for anyone navigating their way across the oceans. And if they did have advanced technology, like we have our computers and GPS systems, then would they really be that lazy and neglectful to not bother designating the tropic circles to their correct constellation titles? Did they really invest so much time building the most advanced astronomical clocks only to neglect their maps? No, they did not. All these historical maps present designations for the tropic circles of latitude that are well over 2000 years old. Why? And why are we still using this designation today? For you see, these maps, and all our maps, including Google Earth, are tools of deception. Where are the maps from the age of Pisces? The maps of the last 2000 years? And could these maps actually be over 2000 years old? It seems like someone does not want us to know the age we reside in or wants to distract us 
from finding out just how important the precession of the equinox really is. This brilliant lady's flat fact leaves us with the following conclusions. The maps, all of them, Mercator and so on, are either 1. Original maps that belong to a period that occurred thousands of years ago and have been given false dates and narratives surrounding their creation. 2. Manipulated copies and versions of original maps that were created over 2160 years ago. Or 3. They are all fake and created during the Great Reset of the last few hundred years to generate a false history and timeline and solidify the false historical narrative and the rise of Galilean heliocentricity. Out of all of these options, the second and the third are most likely. Cartographic world maps are not easy documents to create and establish. They require a solid understanding of our Earth's size and shape. They require a thorough understanding of the circles of latitude that are integral to the workings of our world. They require a complex understanding of the continents and land masses. These maps are likely manipulated duplications of maps thousands of years old or completely fake. And we do see signs of manipulation, especially in regard to the landmass known as Hyperborea. We see Hyperborea in various maps of varying styles and we are told that these are from the 16th century. But towards the 17th century, we see Hyperborea start to be erased from the maps. We see unknown land masses that are present in some of these old maps vanish entirely. And then it dawned on me, the message of this flat fact. We have no trustworthy maps, not a single one. We have no reliable source to show us the bigger picture of the realm we inhabit. I continued my journey, and as I ventured deeper into the forest, the path to the center that led me thus far was gone, and I could not turn back, and there lay no path in front of me. I became truly lost. How to know where you are going if you don't know where you are in the first place, if you don't have a map? All historical waymarks that I had invested some degree of trust in before were now completely unreliable and questionable. How much had been edited by the controllers? How much truth was left? What if all the maps were fake? Why are they hiding the maps of the last 2000 years? We do not have one single accurate or honest world map. And like in all moments of being lost, right before despair takes hold, an unforeseen circumstance arose that set me back on course. I stumbled through thick overgrowth and out into a moonlit clearing with a small lake. At this clearing I met a mysterious figure named Sturgios. I told him I was lost and he told me to come and look into the lake. He told me to watch the water. What did I see? he asked. Myself, I replied, my reflection rippling and glistening in the moonlight. Mirror, mirror. Look beyond yourself, he said. What do you see? And there it was, just as it had always been. Mirror, mirror, way up high. Mirror, mirror, in the sky. Mirror, mirror, oh how they lie.
It cannot be. All this time, hiding in plain sight. A distorted, unreliable yet steadfast reflection. A quasi-photographic image of both our known world and what is this? This is the unknown world. Thank you Sturgios for all your work. Sturgios has mapped out each continent to the minutest detail. His work is meticulous. He has mapped time zones, seasons, flight paths and distances. The first true flat earth map. And it is of utmost importance, primarily due to the unknown landmass over here, that Sturgios has named Terra Vista, after the Aberno Monte landmass of the same name. Why have we never heard of this land before? If the area here is our known world, then the realm is absolutely enormous. But wait a minute, Sturgis's presentation of our known world here maps the five prominent circles of latitude. We see the Arctic Circle, the Tropics, the Equator, and the Antarctic Circle, and Sturgis has mapped the Sun's concentric journey around these circles of latitude, mapping seasons, and time zones with the utmost precision and accuracy. So what's going on? The sun and moon cannot journey the entirety of the land masses presented here because it would take too long. Does this land mass not have its own sun? Or perhaps the moon is not a map of the greater realm after all. But not so fast. We need to spend some time breaking down Sturgios' discovery here. How the image on the face of the moon was and is formed, when it was formed and why are all questions that no one can answer. Nobody knows apart from the deceivers in higher places. But there are a lot of things hidden in plain sight that bring us a little closer to having a better understanding of this mysterious phenomenon. First of all is the nature of this image. It is a composite image. You are witnessing multiple images simultaneously when looking at the face of the moon. And these images are akin to a type of X-ray photography. There is also evidently a lot of distortion and optical illusion present in these images. No one can offer an explanation as to how this composite image has formed nor has anyone ever provided a satisfactory answer as to what exactly the moon is. And rightly so, for if they could, we would not be in this mess in the first place. While most alternative views of the moon's true nature are rooted in nonsensical theories, such as those dreamt up by many deceivers and boys who never grew up, and who like the idea that aliens created the moon and there exist underground bases deep within its craters. There is one man, however, who spoke of the moon in the years leading up to the space race in the 60s and who offered a very sensible insight. In 1965, Professor R. Foster challenged the corrupt scientific complex by stating that landing on the moon was an impossibility. It is an impossibility, according to Foster, because the moon is plasma and not solid. Here is what he said in an interview. Um, what is your theory? Well, uh, it is by now rather more than a theory. Uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I stated to various scientists that the moon is not a piece of rock, but it is a plasma, a plasma phenomenon, a cosmic plasma. Uh, and that this fact will eventually be confirmed. I made certain predictions which were already confirmed in 1958 and the situation now is coming close to a complete confirmation. Scientific views expressed all over the world now that uh, the moon seems to be of a quite different nature of what was assumed. But and the, the Americans and Russians are thinking of landing men on it. Uh, well, that will never happen. Not on the moon. On Mars, on Venus, on other planets, yes. But the moon is definitely, as I assert, a plasma. 
Like most that speak out, Foster was most likely controlled opposition. Notice that he says it is possible to land on other planets, but not the moon. It is likely that it was his task to introduce a half-truth that the moon is a plasma phenomenon only for his claims to be quote, debunked and proved wrong, unquote, a few years later, after they staged the moon landings. Since Foster's claim, however, our own access to technology in recent years has allowed us to investigate the moon in more detail. And through this we see over and over again, varying instances of the moon behaving in a way that debunks a lie that it is a ball of rock. We see with our own eyes a semi-transparent moon, either at night or while there is still daylight. We see the sky through the moon. Sometimes it is even possible to see stars directly through the moon. Many have repeatedly demonstrated that moonlight is colder than the shade at night and therefore it cannot be reflected sunlight as it possesses no residual warmth. We also know that spherical objects do not reflect light. By the laws of reflection, the light concentrates into a highlight point and does not reflect. You can also see frequent crescent moons when both the moon and the sun are within close proximity of each other, meaning that it is impossible for the sun to be cast in the Earth's shadow onto the moon. So if the moon is a plasma phenomenon, then how could this be formed in the first place? It is in the appropriation and demonization of the symbol of the swastika that we find some very interesting insights. The existence of a vast amount of historical literature and symbolism suggestive of a vortex opening in the center of our world is too prevalent to be coincidental. We have looked at much of this before, but strangely enough, in the years preceding and during the complete demonization and eradication of the swastika's association with the vortex, we find some additional information regarding this central vortex that is astonishing. In addition to the appropriation of the swastika as their emblem, the Nazis were also obsessed with a very similar symbol, that of the Black Sun. Prior to the rise of the Nazi regime, there existed an occult secret society within Germany called the Thole Society, sometimes alternatively pronounced Thule, that had sub-factions within it. One of these sub-societies, we are told, was the Black Sun Society. Influenced by the Rosicrucians and other hermetic groups, the Thule Society placed special emphasis on the superiority of an alleged Aryan race with innate mystical powers. The Thule Society derived its name from a mythical northern country in Greek legend. Thule was supposedly a land located furthest north. Others have called it Hyperborea. The Thule Society believed, we are told, that an elder race, the Aryans, colonized our Earth and they were located within the center of our hollow Earth. Admiral Byrd, the military Antarctic explorer, also made reference to a hollow earth with an entrance at the North Pole. The Thule Society also believed that the Black Sun was a big ball of primer materia that existed in the center of the earth and emanated radiation in the form of real energy. This energy has many names, some have called it Chi, astral light, Odic forces or Orgone. In 1933, the main architect of the event known as the Holocaust, Henrik Himmler, acquired Wavelsberg Castle, a wonderful piece of old world infrastructure and technology. He supposedly remodeled the castle and in doing so imprinted the symbol of the Black Sun into the marble floor of what came to be known as the General's Hall. Much of what has surfaced regarding the German secret societies before and during the Nazi regime is deliberate misinformation. K. 
carefully controlled with the sole intention of distraction and demonization. The misinformation regarding these societies has served to further fuel the UFO and alien agenda, which many, such as Jordan Safer, David Wilcock and Corey Good, have since latched onto and promoted. They are part of a controlled opposition agenda. They are liars. The sole intention of disclosing information regarding German secret societies was to yoke together a ridiculous concept of a superior alien Aryan race existing within our world's northern core or opening at the center with maniacal dictatorship that resulted in gruesome genocide or in other words to make them seem crazier than they already were. The controllers of our realm had to appropriate the swastika and eradicate its symbolic association with the Earth's central electromagnetic and physical vortex. And while I do not think there exists a black sun underneath us, if the notion of this seems absurd and far-fetched, just remember that the majority of the world's population have already accepted that there is some kind of dark sphere beneath them acting as a source of our world's electromagnetic energy. Heliocentrism has convinced so many that inside their little blue ball hoax, there exists a spherical core of solid iron at a temperature of over 5,000 degrees. Their own black sun. Interestingly, they never represent this iron core with the metal's usual black or dark grey colour associations in their illustrations despite telling us it is a crystalline sphere of solid iron. Surrounding the iron solid core is an outer layer of molten iron and it is because of this hot liquid iron we are told that the earth has a magnetic toroidal field. And millions have accepted this and these silly diagrams that resemble satsumas despite the hard fact that the furthest depth a human has ever drilled into the earth is a mere 8 miles. The heliocentric model has to acknowledge an inner core energy source because it is in fact a reality and our world cannot exist without it. It is likely that the notion of a black sun beneath us is more distraction, although it is not as absurd as the heliocentric Satsuma model. We will return to this later. What is important now, however, is that not only have we another instance of the concept of a black core at the center of our realm and another reference to a central vortex and opening, but we also have reference to energy or what the Thule Society called Vril radiating out of this opening. And if this is truly the case, then we have a theoretical model in which both the formation of the Sun and Moon makes complete sense. What I am going to try and convey now is complex and I will do my best, but I need you first of all to forget every model of our Earth you have become familiar with. Things may not make sense at first, but by the end it will. Let's start with the realm and the firmament, and then a central opening. And now let's incorporate our known world, as outlined on the moon by Sturgios. And finally, let's add the source or electromagnetic coil beneath. Whether a magnetic rock or an electromagnetic coil, the source of our world's magnetic field is located at the center and beneath and any source of intense electromagnetism would produce strong radiation. No one can say indefinitely, but it is highly likely that the concentrated plasma that we call the moon is a result of a unique form of radiation, similar to x-rays that emanate from this source via an opening or vortex. X-rays or very strong radiation beams would, by the laws of physics, emanate from this central vortex in diverging straight lines. Like X-rays, they would also be invisible. 
the divergent beams would continue up until coming into contact with the firmament itself. X-ray beams differ from light beams and do not tend to reflect. X-rays are like a super powerful form of light and because their wavelengths are shorter than ordinary light's wavelengths, it means their frequency is much higher. Because of this, X-rays can travel through objects that ordinary light cannot and it means that X-rays are not reflected easily. There are not many materials that reflect, scatter, refract or redirect X-rays. And while I'm not strictly saying that X-rays are the cause, any form of strong radiation beams would behave similarly. There do exist some materials that can reflect high energy rays and it was a man named Lawrence Bragg in 1913 that discovered that crystalline structures reflect X-rays. That's right, crystalline structures, a crystalline firmament. Bragg reflection is used, for example, to focus monochromatic light and there is a device called a monochromator that uses curved crystal mirrors to reflect X-rays to focus monochromatic light. Standard monochromators use a prism to break down the light. This is a very familiar image and Wikipedia displays it for everyone to see. It is now associated with an infamous music album. What is the title of that album? Huh, <laughs> they are telling us. This means we're right on track. Radiation beams reflected off of the crystal firmament would likely be redirected down, off center and into the ionosphere above our heads. The same ionosphere in which the ethereal electromagnetic energy was harvested from. It is here that the beams would converge and concentrate and generate the plasma phenomenon we call the moon. The idea of electromagnetic rays reflecting from the firmament and converging in the ionosphere may seem preposterous, but there are many homemade experiments you can conduct yourself to prove the power of concentrating light rays. As seen here, the rays of the sun reflected in the concave mirror are able to produce intense heat and start a fire. The reflected light rays focus into a point to generate energy. And remember, radiation beams akin to X-rays are much more powerful than light rays. If the moon is a point of focused, condensed plasma, then it has to occur within one of the layers in the ionosphere above us. All the various inner noble gases in our ionosphere appear at differing layers and altitudes. We looked at how these are charged by the sun's electromagnetism to form the plasma sky. At a certain altitude in the ionosphere, there are two layers of neon and helium gas. It is likely that the sun forms in a similar fashion within these layers. After all, helium is linguistically very similar to Helios. It is likely, however, that the moon is formed at the level of altitude in which the gas Krypton is present. Krypton is known for its phosphorescent white light. It is also used to create non-thermal or cold plasma as demonstrated by contemporary scientists developing this field today. The primary reason that the moon's light is cold and not hot like the sun's is not known but it is likely due to a polarity produced by their interaction with our electromagnetic field in the ionosphere. The moon being the dielectric negative polarity to the sun's positive charge. The craters seen on the moon are likely from the generation of this plasma. Perhaps it is some kind of plasma emulsion that displays a kind of outgassing or bubbling much like we see with urethane paint defects.
Recently, bizarre theories have emerged that we live within one of these craters on the moon. This is not correct. The moon is some kind of phosphorescent, concentrated plasma and not a solid object. You can see the formation of this plasma and its craters right here. It is not solid, it is a light. And this is great because we have a very realistic and working model as to how the moon is formed. What we don't have, however, is an explanation as to how the composite image on its face is formed. As I said before, the image we are seeing on the moon is akin to a composite X-ray photograph of our greater realm. And it is not an active reflection, but rather a historical moment captured in time. And of course, no one knows how it is formed other than those in high places. The moon is a paradoxical phenomenon, at once a volatile luminary of plasma that waxes and wanes in its luminosity and also a steadfast image captured at some point in time that does not seem to change. We only ever see this image on the moon and it never changes. This strange and mysterious image that has puzzled and inspired millions could be a result of a natural, organic phenomenon or perhaps even artificial. Again, only the controllers know. The word photo originates from the Greek photos. It means light. Hence we have words such as photosynthesis, which means the synthesis of light in which plants harvest light energy and convert it into chemical energy. A photon is the quantum of the electromagnetic field, including electromagnetic radiation, such as light. A huge misconception is the notion that photographic imaging is not a natural, organic phenomenon. This is not correct. The word photograph means light drawing. The concept of natural light sensitive material is well understood. Our bodies begin to darken when exposed to too much sunlight. Depending on the exposure to the UV, our bodies can develop tan lines. The light literally draws on us. Certain textures and textiles can fade or come to the surface when exposed to light. And there exists natural camera obscurers. A natural camera obscura occurs when a darkened space with a hole permits light rays to enter from outside the space, resulting in a projected image of the space outside, inside the darkened area. We can even see projected images of a solar eclipse here on the ground underneath a leaf canopy due to the holes in the leaves. Natural Camera Obscura was, of course, the inspiration for the early development of photographic technology. Interestingly, the noble gas Krypton, the same gas present in our ionosphere, has been used for years, we are told, as an integral component in camera flashes for high-speed photography. It is also an essential component in hyperpolarized MRI scanners. There is also a possibility that the face of the moon is not a natural phenomenon, but was a result of an experiment. Photographic and X-ray films are created for a fusion of a gelatin emulsion with microscopic silver crystals. Because of this, exposure to light is able to capture an invisible latent image. During light exposure, the silver halide crystals grow to visible sizes, and this is what is called printing out the image. Microscopic silver was essential in producing traditional photographic images. Without it, the technology would not have been possible in the first place. Interestingly, in their alignment of noble metals with astronomical bodies, the alchemists designated the moon as having rulership over the metal silver. The birth of modern photography began in 1800, we are told, when the uncle of Charles Darwin tried to capture the image produced in a camera obscura. 
he discovered that by coating white leather with silver nitrate, he was able to partially capture real life images. The use of silver nitrate was developed further by Louis Daguerre, who went on to birth the daguerreotype and modern photography. But what is interesting is that silver nitrate goes by another name. They called it lunar caustic, in homage to the alchemists' association between the moon and silver. It's also quite interesting that many Masonic representations of the alchemists depict the sun and moon as reflected rays. And what are the coincidences that the alchemists, who probably didn't exist in the manner we are told they did, associated the moon with the very metal in which traditional photography is impossible without. This is not a coincidence. Those of the old world knew what the moon was, and perhaps an older civilization that came before them and that were also technologically advanced had a hand in rendering the image on the moon. It's not that much of a preposterous notion considering that we are continually experimenting with things on a cosmological scale today, staging fake rocket launches that sometimes get caught on the firmament, developing artificial suns, and some demons in higher places are even trying to find ways to dim the sun. Humans have always overstretched their ambitions when it comes to the luminaries, and I don't see why advanced civilizations of the past would have been any different. But how this composite image phenomenon came to be is not important for our journey. It's what it shows us that is important. And perhaps it is best to leave the moon shrouded in mystery. Whether a natural or artificial X-ray photographic image, what is important is its composite nature. The image we witness here is a combination of at least two fixed images that are superimposed upon one another. The first image we are seeing, as Sturgios' groundbreaking work has shown over and over again, is a skeletal outline of our realm's land masses, akin to an X-ray, and in a way we have never seen before. In this image, we see all the continents of land we associate with Earth, or what is more appropriately termed the known world, represented by the dark areas in the image. And we also see vast bodies of land and continents that we are completely unfamiliar with. Sturgeus revealed that if you treat the moon as the mirror image it is, and flip its image like you would with any reflection, then you can start to map our known land masses with utmost precision. And this is exactly what Sturgios has done. Mapping the known world captured in the moon down to its great lakes and deserts. The striking similarities between our known world land mass and that captured on the moon are far too exact for it to be any kind of coincidence. It has been right in front of our faces every single day, literally. It is likely that no one has connected the dots here before because of this particular unknown landmass, which Sturgios has appropriately named Lumeria. And this landmass is very important because we know that it does not exist anymore. Theories of Lumeria's existence as a lost continent have been around since the 19th century, with most plotting its location somewhere around the Indian Ocean. Those in the 19th century also spoke of another lost continent, called Mu. They are one and the same thing. Old maps of Mu plot the land exactly where it is on the moon. And in 2007, Masaki Kimura discovered huge structures, including pyramids, castles and roads, on the ocean floor, some way from Japan, a location very similar to where Lemuria is plotted here on the moon. The continent sunk years and years ago, and this is very useful because it means that this image is not an active reflection, but a moment captured in time 
before the continent sunk. The second image we are simultaneously witnessing in our moon is that of the firmament itself. Yes, you heard me right. The moon is the only known official image of our firmament. The face of the moon is a composite image and we have to separate the images to fully understand what we are seeing. We have the landmass of the greater realm and this is one image from one angle. And then we have another image from a different angle. I can only illustrate this by showing you. This specific area of the moon is primarily what gives the phenomenon its spherical 3D appearance. The heliocentric liars love this area of the moon and they have used it as a weapon of deceit against us. It is not a crater with rays like they tell us. Look closer. Really look. This is not the markings of a spherical object. It is the apex of the domed firmament from within the dome. Watch closely. This is the composite image on the moon, presenting both images simultaneously. And this is an interior of a hemisphere dome. And now... You see, if you align the central apex point of an interior hemisphere dome, then it becomes quite obvious. If you erase the remaining vector lines of the dome, then it becomes really obvious. And once you see it, it becomes very hard to unsee. It isn't a sphere. That is an optical illusion. It is the markings of a hemisphere dome. And not only is this the interior apex crown of the firmament, it is also a reflection of the center of our realm below. This area of the moon lends its spherical shape because of the so-called rays that emanate from it. But as you can see, it is an optical illusion. The rays are actually hemispherical ribs stemming from the dome's crown. This area in the middle of these ribs is not a crater. That is the vortex directly beneath the highest point of the dome. The controllers have named this area Tycho. It was given this name, we are told, by Jesuit astronomer Giovanni Riccioli in 1651. If it was not for Tycho, then the controllers of our realm would have a very hard time convincing millions that they lived on a giant spinning ball. And like with everything else, they have used Tycho to hide things in plain sight. For instance, Another 17th century Masonic astronomer named Pierre Gassendi called it Umbilicus Lunaris, the navel of the moon, which is interesting as North mythology uses the same simile of the navel to describe Virgilmir, the whirlpool in the center of our realm. Arthur C. Clarke's Space Odyssey, one of the most famous science fiction novels of all time, features a crater on the moon named Tycho. In the novel, scientists find that there is a strong magnetic field emanating from the crater and discover that it is coming from a black cube monolith buried 15 meters within the crater. A black monolith, a rupus nigra, a magnetic black rock. If you separate the two images, then you can see clearly how they are in fact two images of two different angles that somehow have ended up superimposed on each other. We do not see any oceans or water mass captured in the first image, which suggests there is some kind of X-ray radiation at play. We don't see the vortex at the center in the first image for this reason. And again, no one knows how these images were formed. But if some kind of radiation beams were responsible, then the first image, the land masses of our greater realm, were most likely captured as the rays hit the firmament. And as those rays were reflected into our ionosphere and began forming the plasma mass we call the moon, it is likely that the second image was captured. And that is the image of the firmament, of the structure existing above us. And that's why we can see the outline of this structure, the stars beyond this structure, and the reflection of the vortex 
and other great deeps below. The moon is a masterpiece of distorted perspective, a plasma embodiment of as above, so below. And it's going to take a lot of work and careful consideration in smoothing out this distortion to try and get somewhere close enough to create a proper map of the world we live in. And because the moon is a disc-like mass of plasma, the first image of the land presents some curvilinear distortion. And you can see it here at the edges as the land begins to warp and wrap slightly. A lot of serious work needs to go into creating a flat projection of this distortion. But it shouldn't be too difficult because the distortion is only slight around these edges. And that's why Sturgios can map the circles of latitude, seasons and time zones very accurately. A map without a distortion may look something like this. But important questions remain. If the central vortex is absent from the land image on the moon, then why has Sturgios plotted the land we assume is Hyperborea over here, which is not in the center? And what about all this other land? The sun and moon cannot journey above all of this land, as it would take more than 24 hours to circle all of this, and we know the paths of the sun and moon. And the big one. The one you've been desperate to ask about since uncovering the only map we have. Where is the ice wall that you flat earthers constantly bang on about? Let's start with Hyperborea. And here's where many flat earthers may experience cognitive dissonance. Although Sturgios has plotted Hyperborea here, there is no proof that this is the true Hyperborea. There are a lot of different land masses in this region and we cannot be sure. It pains me to say that Hyperborea may not exist in the way we have come to believe. Mercator's Hyperborea is likely the work of the Masons to throw us off the real path. And this is what our purpose is all about, isn't it? Digging for the truth is difficult business and as we dig deeper, we come to realize that artifacts we found before may not be as useful or important as we first thought. We all get it wrong, but stay with me, no need to despair just yet. It is very interesting that the Aberno Monte map was added to the Stanford University map collection and made available to the public in 2017, the same year the flat earth was gaining huge traction and people were starting to wake up. It's also interesting that it has been arranged as a planisphere. The huge individual sheets of this map were originally arranged as an atlas projection, but David Ramsey purchased the map in 2016 and the team got to work scanning each sheet individually and processing them digitally to wrap around a sphere. Perhaps the release of Monty's marvelous map was an attempt to keep flat earthers thinking Hyperborea was located at the North Pole and to perhaps bring back any that were sitting on the fence and hadn't truly woken up yet. A very subtle act of manipulation. But why would they want the flat earth community to keep fixed on Hyperborea? I have some thoughts regarding Hyperborea, but first we must turn to the clocks. Those of the old world knew. They knew exactly the type of earth they lived upon, and it's displayed for everyone to see right here in the astronomical clocks. The zodiac dial here, or what is officially known as the ecliptic dial, on the Prague astronomical clock, allegedly constructed in the 15th century, does not divide its 30 degree constellation arcs equally. It is also off center from the map behind and appears distorted. And so many clocks of the old world present very similar ecliptic dials. But let's look a little closer at this magnificent Prague clock. As you can see, the zodiac dial contains a border that presents a series of vertical lines. These lines represent a chunk of five days, 
and each zodiac section represents a month. Those of the old world use this dial to track the seasons, the phases of the moon and to present the date. But in a realm of perfect circles, why are 6 of the 30 degree arcs here represented within a smaller space than the other 6? They all contain 5 subsections, so why are they different? As you can see here, the Prague astronomical clock presents the land of Earth in the middle. Why does the ecliptic dial need to be bigger and off-center with the representation of Earth? The official liars of our realm, the satanic controllers, have an answer of course. They tell us it is because the ecliptic dial is a stereographic projection. Stereographic projection is a mapping function that projects a sphere onto a plane. All maps are stereographic projections. We have no accurate maps. Wikipedia tells us that the ecliptic plane is projected onto the face of the clock and because of the Earth's tilted angle of rotation relative to its orbital plane, it is displaced from the center and appears to be distorted. The projection point for the stereographic projection is the North Pole. In their fabricated heliocentric model, the Earth has an axial tilt of 23.4 degrees. The controllers needed to invent the axial tilt to justify the entire spherical lie, to justify the seasons, the vastly differing climates and to justify the absolute fixed position of Polaris over the true geographic north. The reason Polaris does not appear to move, they say, is because Polaris lies nearly in direct line with the Earth's rotational axis above the North Pole, the North Celestial Pole. Polaris stands almost motionless in the sky and all the stars of the northern sky appear to rotate around it. Remember, everything in their model is moving at incomprehensible speeds. But we can see with our own eyes that Polaris remains fixed. If they did not invent the axial tilt, or what is known as the obliquity of the ecliptic, then they would have no way to justify this in their fairyland model of orbiting planets. Polaris does not move, it remains fixed. If you are in Iceland or America, you can film a star trail of Polaris and it remains fixed. But it is not fixed directly overhead in these locations. The only place we are told to observe Polaris directly overhead at a 90 degree angle is the true geographic North Pole. You know, that place where no one ventures. And that's why they invented the tilt. They tell us that Earth's true geographic North Pole is tilting directly at Polaris. And as the Earth spins on its little axis, Polaris appears to remain fixed. They tell us that the star's steadfast nature is an optical illusion. But their lies fall apart swiftly when you consider that the entire constellation system of the stars above remain constant. We always see the same stars and constellations. If Earth was spinning on its axes while orbiting the Sun and the Sun was zooming through our galaxy, which is also moving in a bigger universe, would the precession of the equinox really be that predictable? Would the constellations of the tropic circles of latitude really appear with such consistency in union year after year at the solstice or would it appear a bit more random? They are liars and we all know that water does not lie. Rest in water does not curve or convex. For you see, the satanic controllers are masterminds of reverse engineering. The celestial zodiac ecliptic dial is not a stereographic projection. The entire heliocentric model is reverse engineered science and they had to start at Polaris and trace their steps back to ensure they justified its fixed immovable position 
and made sure it was compatible with their globe. The Prague astronomical clock has been altered drastically over the last 200 years. It suffered fires, been restored and altered. And you can see that here in the way the projection of the Earth behind the clock has changed over time from a flat map to a bulging unsightly sphere. But look, when you align the ecliptic dial with the map of our greater realm, then this all starts to make sense. The zodiac constellations appear distorted, despite all having five equal subsections, because our location is limited within a portion of the greater realm, and this governs our observational perspective of the stars. The shape of this dial has nothing to do with an axial tilt. It is designed this way to reflect our known world within this magnetic field pocket. The realm is much larger and therefore the firmament and circumference of the fixed stars in the water beyond is much larger than the circumference of our own magnetic field. Polaris is here above the center and this is so important. They tell us that our magnetic north pole is separate from what they call true geographic north. Our magnetic north pole is moving. How can that be? Is that just another one of their lies? No, it is not. It is a half truth. They tell us over the course of a century, the magnetic north pole has moved from its location just above Canada to near Greenland and is now en route to Siberia. It is moving fast. Why? The symbol of the swastika and the black sun offer some clues as to why. For years now, flat earthers have come to see the magnetic north pole and geographic north pole as synonymous. But they are not. As you know, the swastika symbolizes the vortex. But the black sun takes its symbolic message further. The central core circle here represents the iron core, the black sun, or what the fictional Mercator called the Rupes Nigra. But look closer. There is another ring outside of the central core. Remember, the black sun is the energetic core inside of the vortex. And remember also that in the heliocentric model, they acknowledge that the Earth's core is a solid iron sphere, but there also exists an outer core of molten iron liquid. They also tell us that this liquid outer core is responsible for producing our moving magnetic field and poles. This is why the pole is moving, because the magnetic field is not emanating from the solid core, but from a volatile outer core. This is what the second circle here represents. And like everything heliocentric related, all you need to do is apply common sense and flatten the curve and things start to make sense. There is not a spherical outer core, but some kind of electromagnetic coil, perhaps even made of molten iron, surrounding the central solid core. At the core we have a vortex opening, but the actual volatile energetic source is beneath. The central core is akin to a central clock dial. It's solid and remains fixed and everything else moves around it. But it is also the keystone responsible for this entire movement. Everything surrounding our world moves. The stars above move, the sun and the moon, and the electromagnetic outer core under us and all the while the land itself and central solid core remain stationary. And not only does this outer core move and take our magnetic north pole with it, but it is highly likely that it moves in accordance with the precession of the equinox, in time with the stars above as they move from their fixed positions. Which means that it probably moves 30 degrees of the realm's circumference every 2160 years. The North Magnetic Pole is slowly moving, 
and it is as natural as the sun and moon's concentric journey above us. And this is why the symbol of the black sun is a 12 spoked wheel. Each spoke represents a fixed constellation of the zodiac. Each section is an individual age. And the result is a situation like this. Every 2160 years, our north magnetic pole circles the inner solid core and vortex by 30 degrees. This is why the pole has moved from Canada and is en route to Siberia. It is traversing the outer central circle, or what is more appropriately termed the magnetic circle. We live inside of a perfect clock, inside of God's clock. The sun and moon circle our magnetic north pole, which is situated roughly at the center of our known world's landmass. But this magnetic north pole circles the inner vortex and completes a full revolution every 25,920 years, or what is referred to as a great year. Each great year consists of 12 precessional or astronomical ages of 2,160 years each. We are on the cusp of entering the age of Aquarius, and this is why our magnetic north pole is en route to Siberia. As the North Magnetic Pole circumvents the Central Magnetic Circle, the toroidal magnetic field moves with it. The Sun and Moon are bound in their revolution by our Magnetic North Pole. And because of this, they move within our Magnetic Toroidal Field only. This is why the Magnetic North Pole will always be the center of our known world. As I said before, the first image of the landmass presented in the moon's face is likely akin to an X-ray image and has not captured any water mass. And because of this, it has only recorded the areas of our realm with high density, such as the land. In the same way, an X-ray image will capture the parts of our bodies with the highest density, like the bone but not the blood in our veins. In a sense, it is appropriate to view the landmass captured here as skeletal. And because of this, it has not captured the water or ocean surrounding our land, nor does it display a differentiation between the frozen landmass and that which is not frozen. If the sun's concentric journey above us is bound by the north magnetic pole here, and its magnetic toroidal field, and this entire magnetic field is moving with the pole, then it is likely we have a situation of a changing climate as this process unfolds. All areas outside of our magnetic field will inevitably be frozen and dark due to the lack of sunlight. And this is consistent with what some of the scriptures have told us. I saw the great rivers, and I came to the great river, and to the great darkness, and went to the place where no flesh walks. I saw the mountains of the darkness of winter. This is your ice wall, and it's not a constant, fixed wall. It is continually melting and refreezing with the revolution of the pole over the course of a great year and each astronomical age. Do you now understand why they are terrified of the ice melting, of our earth supposedly heating up, and why this demonic joke of a man wants to dim the sun? They are using natural climate change due to the rotation of the magnetic pole to justify a whole host of useless measures and money laundering. They are terrified because they are on the verge of losing all control of the narrative. We must save the precious Antarctica from melting, the last unspoiled place on Earth. But as you can see, there is no landmass for us to call Antarctica. It is a complete lie. When they refer to Antarctica, there is only the Antarctic Circle, and a lot of the footage 
at the so-called Antarctica could have been taken at any location around this circle. As you can also see, the land masses of South America, New Zealand and Australia all fall within close proximity to the outer edge of the greater world map and would therefore be within close proximity to the foundations of the firmament itself. This is most likely the reason there is heavy military presence in these regions. The change in climate, the melting of the Antarctic Circle, is as natural as day and night. It is a macro process of the larger clock we live within. We have already discussed how the constellations that the sun is in during the equinox and solstice form a cross on the zodiac wheel when signaling the age and tropic designation. We'll look closer at the Prague clock again. The central dial of the clock is placed within the center of our magnetic field and the sun and moon move within this field. Our magnetic field is off center from the overall greater realm. It isn't an even cross, but a true cross, or what is now referred to as a Latin cross or crucifix. We live within the cross beam of the cross. And in case you hadn't noticed, our magnetic field pocket within the greater realm also forms a crescent moon. Not the type of crescent moon associated with the alchemical mercury and silver, but this kind of crescent moon. The same symbol that the controllers appropriated and redesignated to represent nobility. The cross and crescent are natural expressions inherent in the workings of the timepiece we live within. They are natural expressions of God's clock. And we got it wrong. Polaris is not situated 90 degrees above our north magnetic pole in the region we call the Arctic, home to Greenland and Iceland. Polaris rests above the vortex at the center of the greater realm. And this is where the distinction between geographic cardinal directions and magnetic directions needs to be emphasized. When we travel across our known world or the land within our toroidal magnetic field, we use a magnetic compass and the magnetic pole is in the center. That's why when we travel from west to east, we go in a circle. And when we travel north, we go towards the center. And when traveling south, we move directly away from the center. However, there also exist geographic cardinal points. And what do the scriptures have to say about this? It's right there in Enoch's reference to the four quarters of the world. Our magnetic field, according to Enoch, lies in the geographic north of the greater realm. And the first quarter is called the east because it is the first. And the second, the south, because the most high will descend there. And the west quarter is named the diminished. And the fourth quarter, named the North, is divided into three parts. First of them is for the dwelling of men. The second contains seas of water, the abysses and forests and rivers, and darkness and clouds. And the third part, the garden of righteousness. The vortex is in the center of the realm, or what is more appropriately termed True North. The X-ray image of the land on the moon map does not display this vortex, but as discussed, it is present in the second image of the firmament. At the crown of the firmament, we see it reflected, the navel of the world. It could be that the garden of righteousness that Enoch refers to, and what is also known as Hyperborea, is located right where Sturgius has plotted it. But this land is not the true north or central vortex. That can only exist in the center. And as stated before, there is some curvilinear distortion 
present in the composite image on the moon's face. I have used my little colourful map here strictly for illustrative purposes. I am not a map maker, but I did attempt to smooth some of this distortion out. Let's hope Sturgios tackles the distortion. And in both my quick attempt and the actual moon map, we do see a body of land right in the center. Right here. Perhaps this is the Garden of Righteousness, surrounding the central vortex. And perhaps Enoch's reference to it being located in our northern quarter is because it can only be accessed from within this quarter. Who knows? It is likely that the controllers deliberately put Hyperborea at the Arctic in the fraudulent maps to throw anyone of a curious and adventurous nature off track. If someone set out to find True North using these maps, they would fail. And because of the distinction between magnetic and geographic direction, finding True North would be a monumental feat, even without their deception. If anyone wanted to truly journey to the center of our greater realm, they would have a very hard time, and they would need to forsake the compass altogether. If the geographic south of our magnetic field is down here, with the lands usually associated with south, then the central vortex of the greater realm falls within our geographic north but we would not be able to reach it with the compass pointed north. It is not located at our north magnetic pole. If you use a compass to travel north, you will end up traveling here. If the south pole is the entire Antarctic circle, then to travel to the true north, you would need to go south. But even then, this would most likely fail. If the center is made of iron, then at some point it would supersede the southern magnetic pole of our magnetic field. If by chance you were lucky to head in the direction of true north, then the compass would most likely fail altogether due to the iron core. As the mysterious text, the Inventio Fortunata states, here the ship's compass loses its property and no vessel with iron on board is able to get away. The only way to get to true north is by celestial navigation via Polaris, a skill set that has been generally eradicated from common knowledge. And I bet these oceans are heavily guarded. We will be returning to magnetic fields later in our journey. And we really need to reappropriate the definition of the word planet. Planet, a smaller subsection or fraction of a much larger plane. Time is ticking, viewer. You are wondering why I brought you into this dark forest. Why is all of this important? Because once upon a reset, the established timeline is a lie. We cannot begin to map our revised timeline unless we start plotting it in accordance with the greater realm we inhabit we need to apply the astronomical clock, the ages, to get closer to some kind of clarity. We are not out of the forest yet. And can you feel it yet? The entire matrix is starting to crumble. Everything we've ever learned, everything we've ever relied upon to shape our understanding of the realm we temporarily inhabit, is now unreliable and all we are left with is our own eyes and all we see over and over again is water always seeking its flat level we see structural remains that those in the history books could not have built and we see a great evil multiplying we only have our eyes and old photographs Moments captured in time, the act of photography, the art of juxtaposition, of comparison and contrast. We are so small, 
our world in the mirror. Where are the maps of the age of Pisces? Where has our history gone? And what has become of us now? Are we that different to those we see in the 19th century? Look at us, desperately searching for lost time. Our boots caked in mud, our entire days spent digging through the deception. Digging and moving the mud. Frantically digging. Tired and aching, but not giving up. And what do we find? The same things that our ancestors of the 19th century found. Glimmers of glory, of beauty, of pain and wonder that remain stubbornly silent offering no explanation for its existence or how it came to be. Old photographs and such glory. I haven't shown you just how impossible these structures are yet. The only thing these people have ever built is the lie, brick by brick. And I need to show you how they did it. Our world in the mirror, once upon a reset. There have been many great resets during our realm's history, all very different in nature. We need to look at all of them. How to reset time, to wind back the clock, the death and dawn of a new age. This was not the first reset, nor is it the last. It is happening again right now. Empty cities, such quietness. There is a war going on back home, viewer, and most haven't even realized. A peculiar and irregular type of war. Silent warfare, information warfare, biological warfare. A war as old as time itself. A war between the forces of light and those of darkness. And we're caught in the middle on the cusp of the dawning of a new age. A war for Aquarius, the water bearer. Watch the water. And for us have fell in love with the truth and who have resisted the darkness. We've had the armor of God on now for so long. How many of your friends and family have deserted you? How many of them left you stuck in the mud? and you've remained steadfast. But it's time we took a stand and became very loud. It's time to draw the sword of truth. The blind are going to need us because nothing can stop what is coming. The legend of Ophorus, bearing Christ, bearing the truth so it can reach the masses. I would try my best to continue our journey but as things become even darker, the lights will inevitably go out and our journey may end here. But you have more than you know, more than you need. You've seen enough deception. Do not believe a single thing they say. We have to try and keep moving. The clock is ticking and we don't have much time. We need to go to Siberia. There is something frozen in the ice that needs examining. Come on, it's time to address the big question. Who were the citizens of the future? And it's not what you think. The timeline is wrong and the maps are fake. This is not the answer. No. For you see, they had a king over them. And not just any king. 